Well, I got to tell you, this is Mother's Day, and um, I lost my mom a few years ago, and so it's always kind of a, a, a strange, um, kind of bittersweet day from that point on. And um, I told somebody in the hallway today, he said, how are you doing? And I said, I just feel so scattered, just so, you know, here and there and everywhere. And then I realized, oh yeah, well, that's just what the way it is on Mother's Day for me now. And so uh, this week, knowing that this was going to be Mother's Day, I uh, was looking at the scripture passage, and I had originally, I, actually I was going to preach on the stoning to death of Stephen. <laughs> but, you know, that sort of had that ring to it for Mother's Day. <laughs> <laughs> and I veered away. <laughs> no. And uh, but but the thing is, uh, every time I come up to Mother's Day now, my mind goes to uh, the things that my mom uh, taught me, either specifically taught me, or that I saw throughout my life from her. It's amazing what what you teach someone, not with your words, but actually from them watching you. Maybe. You, teach much more. And so um, as, as I was uh, praying over this passage, I kept thinking almost everything that I'm going to say today was something that I, I learned from my mom in some way, and uh, not necessarily from her words. And she would probably be surprised to say, did I teach you that? You know, but the answer is, yeah, mom, yeah, you did. And uh, so uh, let's jump into it. First of all, this passage says that how we handle problems, conflicts, matters. It really matters. Um, and have you ever been to church before today? <laughs> if you have, see nobody has except me, okay. If you have, you would know that one of the things that is just a weird deal in churches is that, and even, even churches that are, that are really healthy, conflicts arise. Unlike our homes, you know, <laughs> our families and situations. Uh, Things happen, and, and I used to think that if you didn't talk about it or acknowledge it was there, then it wouldn't really be a problem, right? Um, in fact, in, my, in my, my brothers and sisters, you know, we, we have our issues. We were all only children in the same family. And, uh, and we had one where one of, one of my siblings kind of went nuts and, uh, and created this huge conflict among the kids. And we're all emailing each other. That's the thing about email. You start forwarding it. You know, do, 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 do. And, and then all of a sudden there's a series of phone calls as if nothing had ever happened. And so nothing is addressed, you know. And I thought, that's the way it's been in the church. If you just ignore it. Things aren't really going to happen. But what happens is, guess what? They just stay and grow, stay and grow, stay and grow. So here we have the, the, the early church growing. The Holy Spirit is moving through. And uh, more and more people are coming to the Lord and, and being discipled. And they're sharing. And they're caring. You're thinking, this is a perfect church. This is the way God always intended it to be. And now there's a conflict. What do we do with it? And... Uh, I think we can learn a lot about what God wants for us and how we relate, not just to each other, but in our families, in our work, in our neighborhood. How do we relate and how do we resolve things in a way that uh, encourages us all to grow and, and to keep moving forward in the Lord? Now, um, I used to think that if there were problems, that's a sign that uh, people didn't have very much faith or they were spiritually immature. And if I would just teach better, then they wouldn't have these problems. But I found that even among people like you who are so spiritually mature and so gifted and the Lord, and, and uh, even some of you might have a problem or two, a small, small one, you know, but um, there is absolutely no connection between our, our spiritual maturity and the level of problems and conflicts that are in our life. It's not like we can pray our way beyond conflict. It's that how do we pray our way through conflicts and while we're in them? And how do we trust God as we're dealing with the issues that, that are always going to be emerging in our life? 
And, th and that's part of what I want us to look at today. Now, uh, we, we have this beautiful situation where the church is growing. And so whenever a church grows, people who are not like the original group start coming to it. How weird is that? You know, I think, and, and you know, uh, uh, over the years, I keep getting uh, called by churches who want me to come and consider being their pastor, you know, and they always go, oh, you know, we've, we want to really start growing and reaching out uh, to, and bringing new people in and uh, different generations and different everything, and, and we think you can really help us do that, and we're going to just grow and change under your leadership if, if, if God leads you here. And I go, heck no. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not how it works. Because we want to grow without changing. We want more people just like us to come in and have there be more of us. And then everything's great because we don't have to change, right? Growth happens and we're the same. Well, guess what? Maybe God was wrong to do this, but the way it actually works is, in order to grow, we have to change. There's no growth without change. And when change happens, there is... Yes, Eric, there is <laughs> conflict. Now, here's the problem, you know, so, okay, we want to grow. We have to change. There's going to be conflict. Now, what happens is we go... In our ideas, oh, sure, I'm with you, pastor. Of course, in theory, that's how it works, right? Well, guess what? That's also how it works in reality. So we start to grow. New people come in, or we grow spiritually. We start to mature in our faith. We're trusting the Lord more, and, and we're making these changes. And then suddenly there's conflicts, and it can happen just within us. We can be conflicted inside as we change and, and grow, right? And, and somewhere between people, the conflicts happen, and we go, well... We serve a God of peace and love, so if there's conflict, this must be out of God's will. We don't want to be conflicted, so therefore, let's stop changing and stop growing and go back to what we were. This cycle happens over and over and over and over again and has since Acts, when the first church first was born. And I don't think that God wants us to not grow. I think what he wants us to do is trust him through the changes, through the conflicts, through the resolution, and grow through it all. And use these all as opportunities for, for our growth. So here we have this situation. As long as there were Hebrew-speaking uh, Jews who'd become Christians, everything was fine. Because they all had the same way of looking at things and they could communicate well and everybody understood what they were understanding and they had their traditions. Everything's great. It was like the Presbyterian churches I used to serve in. You know, they just were locked in. Boom. And uh, you knew what you got. And, uh, or you wouldn't be there. And, uh, but then, these Greek-speaking Jewish people met Jesus. And they started coming to church. Huh. That's different. Same Lord, yeah, they have the same faith, everything, but they're not like us. But they're here. And so now you suddenly have two circles of people, and everybody, remember the scripture in, earlier in Acts was talking about everybody shared everything, and nobody had needs, and everybody was loving everybody and caring for each other. That's all going on, right? Ding, ding, ding. Except the old guard, which can happen by the second week in a church, by the way. <laughs> Whoever's there week one is the old guard the second week. But, uh, so the old guard is sitting there going, yeah, well, we got our, you know, and they'll get, you know, and then the Greek-speaking widows saying, we're getting cheated here. We're all in this together, and we're being cheated by the old guard. We're not being uh, welcomed in the same. We're not really sharing equally around the tables, and um, we're being swindled in the church by our fellow Christians, and that's not right. So, complaint comes to the disciples. Now, here's where we, we can really start learning. What did the, the disciples do that was different? It's for the first time, we see them 
doing leadership differently than before. In Acts chapter 1, remember when they had to decide who's going to be the new key disciple, new leadership, and they, and they had to select, you remember what they did? They brought out the dice and shot craps. Whoa, hey, hey, you're in. Okay, you come in. You're the new leader. That was their leadership development program before the Holy Spirit. Hope they didn't have loaded dice. That's a whole nother deal. But uh, now, after the Holy Spirit, we see the same dilemma. How do we pick leadership without just bringing out the dice, seeing who gets called? Well, they do it differently. They get together and uh, pray and, and seek out some people who are people of character, of wisdom, of the Holy Spirit, right? Say, let's, let's give it to them. Now, let me tell you what they didn't do. What they didn't do was fix the problem themselves. They didn't do that. Now you come with this big division. This could split the church right down the middle. And they come to the disciples and they say, we've got a problem. What are you going to do about it? And their answer was, not a thing. They're not going to fix it. They're not going to settle it. Now that was really intriguing to me. They refused to solve the problem for the people. And that got me thinking, why? Why was that so important that they said, no, we're not going to solve this for you. We're not going to. It had to be significant. And, and it got me thinking that um, our goal is not solving problems. Our, our goal is developing people, right? In fact, one of, my, one of my favorite authors, John Westfall, uh, <laughs> in, in the book Building Strong People, I was just drawn to his writing. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, it, this is what he says. There's a great deal of confusion among church leaders about their roles. There's often a belief that they're expected to be managers, to be efficient, effective, and resourceful in managing God's resources as administered by the local church. Good writing. <laughs> Certainly there's a need for management some of the time, but all too often we step in and try to help God do it better. Never realizing or knowing the damage we can cause in the lives of others. We've taken, we have taken care of people and done it for them so long that we've created congregations of people who are passive, dependent, uninspired, inhibited, and uncreative. That's what happens when the leadership steps in and says, oh yeah, yeah, we'll handle it, we'll handle it, we'll handle it, handle it for you. And they wouldn't do that. They, they wouldn't deny that there's a problem. They said, yes, there is, we'll talk about it. They, they didn't blame people. They said, let's identify some people, wisdom, character, Holy Spirit, and let them resolve this. They didn't even tell them the steps that they wanted it resolved. They just said, go take care of it handle it. Right? Fix it. That was perhaps one of the most radical moves in the life of the early church that transforms the way a church exists. And, um, you know, I need to learn from it personally, uh, just because it's easier sometimes to step in and just do it rather than trust someone else to come along and, and come up with a plan that might be different than mine. Whoa! And then I have issues <laughs> letting go. Now, here's some things that uh, learn from this. Um, first of all, the seven people they picked, Bible scholars and historians tell us, were all Greek. All seven were Greek. They didn't do, you know, the uh, typical thing we do now where let's get a mix of people from both sides of the issue. They said, no, if there's injustice, why don't we pick seven people who happen to be on the unjust side and let them solve it? This is Mother's Day, right? These seven are probably the kids of the Greek-speaking Jewish widows. The 
These are their children. You think they'll be taken care of now? Oh yeah. I think they're going to get their fair share at the table now because their kids are in charge of looking out for them. What a brilliant move. It's going to be fair now. And I just love that uh, they picked all seven Greek-speaking Jewish people. Fabulous. Not one of the old guard in the resolution group. And so they had some hope. Now, a couple of lessons. And some of these are what my mom taught me. And the first one is, you can't do everything. My mom seemed to understand that. In fact, um, uh, then the, the night before she passed away, we were sitting and talking, and I think I've told you this a couple times. Um, uh, she, out of nowhere, she looked at me and went, John, remember who the shepherd is. And I went, yeah, yeah, I know, you know. Uh, she said, no, no, remember who the shepherd is. And then she died that night. And I thought about that, and I thought, what was she trying to tell me? Well, she's trying to tell me, you're not the shepherd. That's the point. You're not able to do everything. You can't carry every sheep. You can't carry the flock on your back. You might carry one or two, but you'll drop them. You know, Jesus is the good shepherd. That means the flock is in the good shepherd's hands, right? We can't do everything. And, and that is so important for us to know. Well, throughout the New Testament, we're, we're hearing about this, the Holy Spirit moves. We all have gifts for ministry, but we don't have all the gifts for all the ministry. That would make some of us redundant and un unnecessary. We're all needed as, as, as the Holy Spirit gifts us and calls us to ministry. So we can't do everything. But here's the point. We all can do something. We all can do something. And God's calling us to do something. And, and so we need to say, Lord, how would you use me now? How can I... Uh, be your agent for change and, and justice and healing and, and rest, restoration and event. how can I be used by you where I am right second thing is we need to turn it over we need to turn it over to the Lord and we need to turn it over to other people and these disciples didn't just assign uh, you know here's your work order and here's how it's going to be done and these are the steps for completion and come back when you're finished. It was like, okay, you got a problem. Here, fix it. What, are we, what should we do? Whatever fixes it. Any of you Saturday Night Live fans? <laughs> yeah, a couple, uh, what was it, a, year, a couple years ago, one of the characters had, uh, he was a renowned uh, economist uh, and economic strategist the world, was when, the, when our economy was tanking and so he would come on and they'd give him this big build up of how wise and everything is uh, sort of like you <laughs> and uh, global economics and so he gets up and, they, and he says okay here's, here's what needs to happen fix it fix it and they're going really that's, that's what yeah fix it we have these problems we have these issues we have, fix it and then they said, well, do you have a plan for this? Yes, I have a three-step plan. Step one, fix. Step two, it. Step three, fix it. <laughs> that was the skit. I loved it. You know, I thought, okay, you got it. That's very biblical. The, 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 the difficulty is that um, we sometimes get confused. And when there's, when there's a conflict or a problem, we get confused and... Um, and my mom taught me something, and that, it's very simple in a way, but it's also profound, and it applies here. She used to teach me that the problem is the problem. That's it. If there's a problem, that's what you work on. Now, for me, I'm not, I don't think that way. I, I rebelled, and so I always think that if there's a problem, it's the people. You know? Yeah, if we get rid of them, if we wall them off, if we shut them down, you know, I, I, whenever there's a problem, I immediately think, okay, who's involved in this? Who do, who do I have to fix? Right? And so I spend my life trying to fix people, which is really ineffective. Okay? I've had a very ineffective ministry trying to fix people and letting the problems go. Right? And, and, and 
At no point did the disciples identify the bad ones, who the problem people are, the need to be corrected. No, none of that. They just go fix the problem, right? And so we we have this. Um, and, and you know, I grew up in a you know Presbyterian church. We were uh, uh, we never dealt with problems. We dealt with the the problem is the process. It was like process. Pro everything was process, and, and and nothing was ever resolved. People or problems. It was just all process. We were working on it forever. It was one of the most ineffective things you could possibly do. But um, but I was good at that. Um, I became a genius at the most ineffective thing you can do. <laughs> what does that say? Um, but anyway, and then the next thing is uh, we need to look for opportunities for ministry where we are. And my mom really, really pushed this home. Uh, there are opportunities for ministry all around us that we're usually blind to or oblivious of because we're looking for something big somewhere else. When that big ministry opportunity comes over there, I'm going to be so ready, right? And we miss all the things that God wants us to be engaged in right here. Because we're waiting for the big thing over there. Now she knew this because as a young married couple with four little tiny kids, she and my dad were in a fit of weirdness, packed up and we all moved to Africa because over there is where the big ministry is supposed to be. And then guess what they found out? It's basically just like what you have in LA. No different. Come home, same issues, same stuff, same people, you know. And, and then we realize ministry is what happens where we are. And Dick Halverson, who used to be chaplain of the US Senate, uh, uh, a guy came to him, he was speaking at um, University Press when I was there, and uh, his niece was my secretary, so he'd come to do her wedding, and we were kind of standing out in the hallway, and some guy came up and started asking him about, you know, where will God use me? How, you know, I, I can't be used where I am, I don't think, and, and Dick looked at him and said, well, I don't know if God can use you where you are, but I sure know he can't use you where you're not. <laughs> That was it. Walked away. <laughs> Thank you. He can't use you where you're not, but where are you? That's where he can use you. Right? You know, maybe you're in education or a teacher or something. Well, then what does God want to have happen through you in, in, the, in the educating? Maybe you're in a medical world and hospitals or something, health care. Where does God want to use you there? Maybe you're in administration and sales and things. How does God want to, what kind of situations does he put you in where, where you can be God's instrument there? It, wherever you are. He can, that's where he wants to use you. And then finally, I think that God is calling us to jump in. Um, one thing I learned from my mom was she, she really hated to be on the sidelines. She hated to watch the parade go by. You know, if there was a parade, she wanted to be in it. She probably ran to the front to lead it. <laughs> the parade's going, get in front, you know, and the, looks like you're leading, you know. And uh, we were always encouraged to jump in, and, and despite anything, uh, she was always kind of subtly pushing us until we were in. And uh, thinking about this reminded me of uh, uh, back when I was at University Press years ago, um, Tim Snow was the, uh, the pastor's there, and he had a couple of little girls, and, uh, and he, he told this story about how he, his youngest daughter had um, signed up for swimming lessons. And she went to the pool, she had a little bathing suit on, and was terrified of getting in the water. So they did, you know, like a good dad, you know, he's down there with the swimming instructor and everybody, and they're all in the water going, jump in, honey, <laughs> jump in. And she's standing there, no, I'm not jumping in. No, oh, just jump in, honey. You know, you're a big girl, you're a big girl. You can jump in, come on, you're really a big girl. And finally the daughter just crossed her arms and went, I'm not as big as I look. <laughs> now for a three-year-old, that's pretty good, you know. I'm not as big as I look. And I thought about that in terms of ministry for years because we think, well, when, when our faith is big enough, then God's going to use us. When, when, when I have enough beliefs and I've got answers to questions, then God can use me. When I grow in, in my spirituality and when I grow in my understanding of the Holy Spirit, my experience, that, then God can use me. 
It's not about how big we are. It's about the big God that we serve. It's how big the Lord is. And it's how big the Holy Spirit is in us. And it's how big the vision is that God has for our world. We can be small. It doesn't matter. He wants to take us where we are and just jump in. Because we jump into the arms of a big God who loves us. Who's going to be there for us. Who's going to carry us and he's going to love us and he's going to use us. And he invites us to step out. Now, if we do this, if you believe what this is saying, and we step out, will it be trouble free? Yeah. Oh, no, no. no. <laughs> Sorry, I got to listen to myself. No, it won't be trouble free. Will there be conflicts? Oh, I hate conflicts. I hate having conflicts with myself. I always lose. <laughs> Will there be total agreement and harmony and everybody love you for doing that? Nah, probably not. In fact, I love, I love that um, they pick Stephen and they say, oh, a man of faith and oh, the Holy Spirit and Stephen full of God's grace and power did great things and miracles and loves and signs. Opposition arose. <laughs> you know, this guy, wow. Yeah. In fact, if we're where God wants us to be, opposition will probably arise. And the point is, who cares? So what? Because it's not how big we are. We serve a big God. All right? All right. So, Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you for your presence. We need you so much. We pray that you would catch us when we jump. And we pray that you would comfort us when we're broken. And that you would heal us when we have dis-ease. And that you would be strong in our weakness. But Lord, thank you that you don't give up on us. And that you, you use us for your purposes. In spite of ourselves. And so, we follow you by faith. And we step out by faith. And we're grateful people in Jesus' name. Amen.